from the New Arts and Media Studios in Milwaukee. I'm Charles Purcell. This is The Log for Wednesday, September 22nd. First day of fall. Well, the first full day of fall is tomorrow, but it arrives today at 2.20 p.m. Central Time. Or if you're listening later, it happened at 2.20 p.m. today. Autumn Equinox. I always like to mention on the program the arrival of the autumn and spring equinox and, of course, the summer and winter solstice. You know, I'm not a religious guy. If I have a religion, this is about as close as we come. I love the dance of the uh, planets and the sun and how we all are spinning through space. It's kind of a wonderful thing. The pattern of our revolution around the sun over the year is a perfect representation of the yin-yang symbol, which just really knocks me out. I love that. It's, uh, it's not made up. It's not pretend. It's, it's real. It's happening. It's nature. If you track the revolutions of the Earth along with the big revolution around the sun, it quite literally creates the, uh, the yin-yang pattern with the two solstices and the two equinox perfectly spaced around that circle. So I always take note of those four moments in time. A great little reminder that we're all part of this great cosmic dance. We're taking part in it. We are participants. It's not just a game. It's not just a ritual. It's not just some made-up story. It's real. It's happening. And uh, I like that. If you're curious, I'm looking at the old Farmer's Almanac right now. I used to get that every year. I should start doing that again. I, that was always a fun tradition, getting the almanac. Let's see. As I said, 2.20 p.m. Central Time. And that's the other beautiful thing. It doesn't roll with uh, the time zones, which, are, of course, are artificial. <laughs> no, it happens for everybody on the planet, everybody in the universe, all in the same moment. The autumnal equinox, also, well, I should point out it's the autumnal equinox in the northern hemisphere. I don't want to be parochial about this. Of course, in the southern hemisphere, it's the spring equinox. The word equinox itself comes from Latin equus, meaning equal, and nox, or night. On the equinox, day and night are roughly equal in length. During the equinox, the sun crosses what we call the celestial equator, an imaginary extension of Earth's equator line into space. The equinox occurs precisely when the sun's center passes through this line. When the sun crosses the equator from north to south, this marks the autumnal equinox. When it crosses from south to north, that's the vernal or spring equinox, of course, again, in the northern hemisphere. Of course, now the days become shorter, the nights longer, the sun continues to rise later, and nightfall arrives earlier, and of course ends with the December solstice, when the days start to grow longer once again. We just had the official harvest moon, the full moon, a couple of nights ago. The full moon rises around sunset for several nights in a row, which traditionally provided farmers with just enough extra light for them to finish their harvests before the killing frosts of fall set in. Normally, the moon rises about an hour later each night, but around the time of the fall equinox, the angle of the moon's orbit and the tilt of the earth line up just right and cause the moon to rise only about 20 to 30 minutes later each night for several nights in a row. So there you go. There's the science of it and the beauty of it. Again, I'm not a religious person, but the uh, notion of experiencing awe is not the sole possession of the religious. No, there's plenty of awe-inspiring moments that nature provides. And over the years, as uh, science has been able to explain things to us, it doesn't diminish the wonder and the awe. It only enhances. It only brings it closer. And it makes it real in our lives and in the blood that flows through our veins and the tides that rise and fall. So I love, I love this time of year. And for all of the sort of traditional basic reasons as well, the cultural reasons, 
the World Series and football season and pumpkins and apples and falling uh, colored leaves and all of it. <laughs> all that crap. I love it. I just love it. I don't uh, fear or dread the coming of winter like a lot of people do. I like to be a pretty cozy guy. I'm in touch with my Huga. All right. So happy Equinox, everybody. Take a moment to uh, acknowledge your place in the universe. All right. Let's let's uh, grab some headlines today. See what's going on. News. Hey, this is an interesting headline. U.S. Senate Schumer mulls passing election reform without Republicans. We haven't talked about this too much on the program because, frankly, I've been pretty uh, pessimistic about the whole notion that any sort of election reform would have any chance of passing. But I don't know. <laughs> Lucy and the football. Is this a glimmer of hope? Reuters reports. U.S. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer signaled to Republicans on Tuesday that if they block an upcoming election reform bill, he will look for a path around the chamber's filibuster rule to try to pass it with only Democratic support. All right. Okay, Chuck. <laughs> Schumer noted that Democratic Senator Joe Manchin, a moderate, that's a moderate, a conservative, who wields great power to advance or block legislation in the narrowly divided chamber, has signed on to try to secure Republican support. Okay, this we know. This much we knew. This was a headline a couple days ago. Manchin has come out and said, yes, I favor this legislation. I'm going to work on getting 10 Republicans, <laughs> to which we all rolled our eyes. Yeah, right. That's going to happen. Congressional Democrats are reacting to at least 18 Republican-led states that have enacted laws restricting voting access this year, following Republican former President Donald Trump's false claims that 2020 election was stolen uh, from him through widespread voting fraud. We're going to take action to make sure we protect our democracy and fight against the disease of voter suppression, partisan gerrymandering, and election subversion that is metastasizing at the state level, Schumer said. So here we go. We're in the same old boat. Democrats saying the right thing. They almost always say the right Very often, at least, they say the right thing. They are in line with what I believe, with what a majority of Americans believe. Quite often, their rhetoric is, all right, good. But when's the last time we saw any results? Of course, the Senate filibuster rule requires 60 members of the Senate to pass legislation, which means 10 Republicans, which means it ain't going to happen. So we're back to the idea that we can convince Manchin to set aside the filibuster, which he has said up and down, right and left, he's not going to do. But reading again here, as Senator Manchin said earlier this year regarding congressional action on voting rights, inaction is not an option. That's his quote quoted by Schumer in his Senate floor speech. I agree with Senator Manchin in that regard. So he's hanging his hat. He's, he's hanging everything on that one comment from Manchin. Inaction is not an option. So it might be a stretch. It might be a big stretch to interpret that Manchin quote to mean, yeah, he's willing to set aside the filibuster because he's also said the filibuster is here to stay. So, Manchin has said two things. Regarding voting rights, inaction is not an option, quote. And regarding the filibuster, he ain't going to do it. Those two are in conflict. One of them has to win. And Schumer is just threading the needle and trying to convince us that it's possible, trying to convince Manchin, hey, man, you said it. We have to do this. You said you favor the legislation. Give us a break on the filibuster. I don't know. Is this just ridiculous? I, sh I shouldn't even brought this up. I don't know. I can't help it. <laughs> I'm hopelessly optimistic. I don't know why at this point. All right. So let's, uh, let's hope we can do something. President Joe was at the United Nations yesterday. Um, also in the category of all talk and no action. Biden pledges to double U.S. climate change aid. Some activists unimpressed. 
uh, Reuters again here. U.S. President Joe Biden told the United Nations General Assembly on Tuesday he would work with Congress to double funds by 2024 to $11.4 billion per year to help developing nations deal with climate change. Oh, okay, whatever. <laughs> Let's put some meat on this bone here. The funding would help achieve a global goal set more than a decade ago of $100 billion per year to support climate action in vulnerable countries by 2020. I guess from Joe's vantage point, as a capitalist, he had to repeat the other day, I'm a capitalist. He was talking, did we talk about this? I forgot. He was uh, making his case for tax increases on the rich. And he said something to the effect of, uh, I got nothing against millionaires and billionaires. God bless you. Good for you for making all that money. I'm a capitalist, he had to say very openly. I just want you to pay your fair share. So making that very reasonable kind of centrist argument. But of course, when I hear I'm a capitalist, I just roll my eyes and say, well, game over. Because there's no way we're going to make any advances against climate change as long as capitalism survives. It's virtually impossible. We have to shift away. We just absolutely have to. So he's talking tough. And he's using, again, Democrats, <laughs> they're in their rhetoric, talking about how it's our greatest challenge as a world community and that there's no more time to wait. Says, says all the right things, but nowhere even near the solutions needed. Reading from Reuters again, but as the world's second biggest greenhouse gas emitter, other campaigners said the pledge still falls short. The U.S. is still woefully short of what it owes, and this needs to be increased urgently, said Mohammed Adow, director of Power Shift America. Greta Thunberg, environmental activist, criticized climate speeches and pledges at the U.N. as hollow. It's quite easy to understand why the world's top emitters of CO2 and the biggest producers of fossil fuels want to make it seem like they're taking sufficient climate action with fancy speeches. The fact that they still get away with it is another matter, Thunberg wrote on Twitter. Yeah, we're nowhere near climate solutions. The goals themselves, the stated goals from countries around the world, are inadequate, just saw a headline yesterday that China is doing away with new coal production, so I guess there's something. But the U.S., we're in the midst, as we speak here, of this, uh, you know, the infrastructure bills, the so-called bipartisan bill, and then the larger budget package. Uh, that's not done. We've been kicking that ball around for months. There's some climate mitigation in the larger bill, in the $3.5 trillion. And uh, there, there are a lot of good things to say about that bill. I'm not going to criticize it. But the climate mitigation elements are, are not enough. The only thing that's going to get us where we need to go is real radical change. And you and I know what that is. It's completely transforming how we work and how we move around and uh, how we grow and distribute food. It's the kind of radical reform that... I'm not sure this country is capable of. We can fight for it. We can holler for it. We can demand it. And uh, like many things that seem impossible and then come true, you know, how else are we going to sleep at night? I'm just going to lie awake with my eyes wide open in terror. If I don't have some hope, some belief that it's at least possible, we have to completely discard the idea of profit we're not going to buy our way out of this. Anybody who promises solutions to climate change, while at the same time promising continued economic growth and job growth, is lying to you. Or if not, if not lying, they actually believe this, they are just dead wrong. We cannot buy our way out of the climate crisis. We can't profit our way out of the climate crisis. We can't produce our way, grow our way. No, no, no. No. <laughs> Profit has to go. Growth has to be eliminated. We need negative growth. We need less economic activity. We need less stuff. We need less transportation. We need fewer planes in the air. We need all food grown locally. 
We need all borders open so people can travel freely around the globe. These are the radical solutions we need. And that's why my good angel and bad angel on my shoulders, the pessimist and the optimist, are battling it out. How in the world do you think this is possible? Open borders? Abolishing money and profit? What are you, crazy? An, an insane dreamer? But then the other angel says, well, it's, it's the only way. Well, yeah, it, it is the only way. So what are you saying? You're just giving up? We're just doomed? Because we are. We're doomed. If profit and borders and the corporate nation states, if all of these things continue to rule our world, then yeah, we're doomed. Both angels agree about that. But one of the angels on my shoulder says, so let's keep fighting. So who's going to win this battle? Our better and worse angels. Yeah, don't let anybody tell you that we can continue to grow the economy, continue all this robust trade, continue to produce. GDP has to grow and grow. Everybody has to have a job. Everybody has to be productive. That's the thinking that got us here. That's old, old thinking. And of course, we're in the midst of, and aren't we always, of immigration crisis. And we have literal battles happening at the southern border. Yeah, try to convince anyone in this political climate that all borders need to be open. Sounds insane. Sounds crazy to some people. Might sound crazy to you. I'm here to tell you it's not. And it's not just me. I'm not a lone voice. There are plenty of folks who advocate for open borders. Look them up. Do a little search. Find those voices who advocate for open borders. Spend an afternoon and do a little reading. And then... Uh, and then come back and tell me what you think. It's the only thing to do. It's the only fair thing to do, just from a moral standpoint. And it's also the right thing to do from an economic standpoint. And it's the only thing to do from an environmental standpoint. You know, I often think, uh, those, those of us on the left, us uh, self-righteous lefties, we look at so-called gated communities, right? And with... Uh, with ire, with resentment. We have lots of bad thoughts about these rich, privileged folks who live in gated communities and they have their private security forces. The image comes up of the two, uh, the Missouri couple, right? Holding guns on Black Lives Matter supporters. The gated community, protected from the world, from their economic privilege, from their white privilege. And they are in literally gated communities. It's not a metaphor. These <laughs> closed communities with gates around them and fences. And the bad people are kept out. Well, what are we here in the United States, if not a gated community? How, how's that different? It's not different. It's, it's exactly what we are. The United States is a gated community. And all of us benefit from that. Well, you can't have free migration. People will come in and will we'll ruin our good lives. And even though many of us suffer, a great many of us are doing fine, or at least we're getting by. Certainly from a world standard, from a world standard, most of us are rich. I'm, I'm in the 1%. When you look at uh, global incomes, when you look at just U.S. incomes, I'm in the bottom third. I don't make much money. I make enough to get by. And I don't know about you, maybe you're scraping pennies together to pay the rent every month. I don't know. Or maybe, like me, you're just kind of making just enough to pay your bills. You can't do anything big or fancy, but, you know, you're getting by. If you're in that situation, that puts you in the bottom third nationally and in the top 1% globally. These are perspectives we just don't either understand, we don't know, or if we happen to see a headline somewhere that we just we don't care to believe. So I'm never going to do a blame the victim thing. I'm not going to jump on people who are really struggling. Okay, just do what you need to do. But for many of us, and possibly for most of us here in America, we are quite literally living in a gated community. We have the same relationship to the poor of the world as those rich folks on the hill have to the rest of us here in the country. 
the poor and middle class, the working class. So if we're going to solve the climate crisis, we have to solve economic inequality. We have to put behind us forever the idea of forever growth in GDP, in production, in jobs, in economic activity. We have to put that behind us. That's a pretty big shift, isn't it? A pretty big uh, 180 of our mindset. Yeah, it is. I'll admit that. But at some point, we have to understand that it's true because it is true. And it's not only climate crisis, although that's the existential threat of our day. Right alongside of that, hand in hand, is the pandemic. Talk about a mindset. Talk about the way we rationalize, the way we convince ourselves of the narrative we want. It's incredible to see how we're behaving. U.S. COVID deaths, as we speak, the number I'm looking at, 1,900 per day. So we're almost up to the 2,000 a day. Associated Press reporting, COVID-19 deaths in the U.S. have climbed to an average of more than 1,900 a day for the first time since early March, with experts saying the virus is preying largely on a distinct group, 71 million unvaccinated Americans. The increasingly lethal turn has filled hospitals, complicated the start of the school year, delayed the return to offices, and demoralized health care workers. 22 people died in one week alone at Cox Health Hospitals in the Springfield-Branson area. West Virginia has had more deaths in the first three weeks of September, 340, than in the previous three months combined. Georgia is averaging 125 dead per day, more than California or other more populous states. It's been widely reported that Mississippi got lots of press because their governor was on one of the Sunday shows. If they were counted as their own country, they'd be number two in the world on per capita deaths. And still we have the so-called debates a local school district here right up the road in Menominee Falls, where I live here in Milwaukee, one of the suburb exurbs up here. School boards passing policies, fighting against so-called unconstitutional mask mandates. As we cross these horrible thresholds, just in the last few days, we have surpassed total deaths from the 1918 flu pandemic. We are fast approaching the number we thought we would never reach, 750,000 total number of deaths from the Civil War. Unfathomable numbers. And we're in the midst of it. And it is very much related. It is exactly akin to the climate crisis. Facts we don't want to face. Solutions we just can't bring ourselves to enact. Because like climate crisis, this and future pandemics will only be faced, will only be defeated by fundamental structural reform. Income inequality among people, among nations. The inability to travel freely around the globe, to migrate. Harsh immigration laws, closing off borders to our big old gated communities. Joe Biden promising these paltry sums in comparison to the riches of the world, these paltry sums to dole out to poor countries, as though that's any kind of a solution. It's a Band-Aid at best, at best. No, the good angels and the bad angels on our shoulders are fighting this out. Real, fundamental, structural reform about how we make our way through this world. The way we live, the way we produce, the way we consume, the way we travel, the way we work. All of it, all of it requires a big old 180 turn. We got to turn this ship. At some point, enough of us have to understand this so we can all get on board and make it happen. And if we don't, a great many of us 
can get through life just fat and happy. We can close our eyes. We can close our ears. We can live our lives taking advantage of the privileges we enjoy. Oh, yeah. Don't know how long. Depending on where you are and what condition you're in. Probably get through this lifetime without ever having to face any of it. Sure. Maybe even your kids, maybe even their kids. I'm not sure how long this is going to last. But I know this. I know it can't last forever. And I also know that there's going to be devastating hardship on literally billions of people. If you want to stay blind to that, if you want to enjoy whatever time you have left and whatever your kids have left and your grandkids have left, if you just want to say, shut up, I'm going to enjoy life. I don't want to know about my responsibility. It's not my responsibility. My only responsibility is to myself and to my family. Make sure we're safe and fed and happy. I have no other responsibilities, you tell me. All right. If that's your thought, if that's your idea, I don't know how to convince you otherwise. It's not my thought. It's not my idea. I feel a kinship. I feel a kinship. And especially on this day of the autumn equinox, when we all share that beautiful moment as the planet spins and revolves around the sun and we all travel through space together, we're all traveling together. We share this planet. We share the natural world. We share the plants and animals and the seas and the skies that sustain life and bring us joy. If you're comfortable living in your gated community and turning a blind eye and a deaf ear to what needs to be done, I don't know what else to tell you, except I'm not with you. All right, so here's hoping. Here's hoping that enough of us can understand the job ahead and to not only do the job, but take joy, take pleasure in doing it. Because, and this is the last thing I'll say, it's not a sacrifice. I'm not asking anybody to sacrifice. When all of our food is grown locally, when we stop all the ridiculous production, when we get all the toxins out of our water and out of our air and out of our blood, when we open up borders and welcome the world as one family, there's, there's no sacrifice there. See, I think people hear that they need to sacrifice. They need to give up what they have. Well, what you have is artificial. What you have, you only have because other people can't have it. When we all share the world and we treat it properly and we live in it as one among many, there's no sacrifice in that. There's only joy. There's only fulfillment. I'm as convinced of that as I am of anything. And I'll, I'll, to my dying breath, I'll try to convince you. All right. Let's leave it there for now. I'll talk to you again tomorrow. Happy Equinox. I love you. I'm Charles Purcell.